At least Shia LaBeouf isn't in this one. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Josh. Today we're going to be talking about Indiana Jones and The Dial of Destiny. This is the fifth film in the franchise, the first one to not be directed by Steven Spielberg. This is instead directed by James Mangold, who has made some of my favorite films of the last decade or so. We've got Logan, we've got 310 to Yuma, um, Ford v Ferrari. There's just a lot of films that this guy has made that are really good. I don't think he's really missed yet. As far as my thoughts on Indiana Jones as a franchise go, I love the original trilogy. I think the end of Last Crusade with Indy, his father, and his other comrades riding off into the sunset is just the perfect ending. Crystal Skull isn't as bad as I think people make it out to be, but I do think that it feels like an unnecessary sequel that doesn't need to be there. It pales in comparison to the first three, and it's just not a film that I go to revisit very often. In Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, Indy, accompanied by his goddaughter Helena, played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, must prevent a crew of neo-Nazis from retrieving Archimedes' dial, an ancient artifact that has has the potential to alter the course of history. I like that premise. It's simple, it's to the point, it provides some room for the film to be a little bit more character focused on giving an arc to Indy and sort of just rounding out this journey that he's been on. And I gotta say, the first hour I really enjoyed. In fact, I was shocked by how much I was enjoying myself watching the first hour or so of this movie and then the issues started to become really apparent. Let's start with the things that I like first though. The opening sequence of this movie is the flashback scene to World War II, it's 1944, and we get the de-aged Indiana Jones performing a sort of train heist, and this is just classic Indiana Jones. I absolutely loved this sequence. The de-aging used here to make Harrison Ford look younger is honestly some of the best I've ever seen. Like, it genuinely rivals Nick Fury in Captain Marvel. It's one flaw I would say is probably that the voice doesn't really match the face, you can tell that he's his voice has become a lot more gravelly and it just doesn't match what you're seeing visually when you watch his lips move. Still, I found it very impressive and it adds a lot to this scene and it just it feels like a classic Indiana Jones adventure, which is what I wanted this whole movie to be. After the prologue, we find ourselves in 1969. The moon landing is just now happening. Indiana Jones is basically retired from his archaeology days. He's old. The movie does play off of that in a certain sense as well. In fact, the first time we see him, he's shirtless. He's asleep. He he wakes up, it's like 8 a.m. and there are people across the street making noise and he's all upset about that. And I've seen a lot of people getting annoyed with that and thinking that Disney is assassinating another one of our favorite characters. And I've never really understood that line of thought. I just really like a good redemption storyline or a really good rising out of the ashes storyline. And also, when you have an 80-something-year-old man who's being woken up by loud music early in the morning, I mean, this is just how I would expect one to act. It's how I expect to act when I'm that age. One concern that I want to address going into this is that I was a bit worried that Harrison Ford would phone it in a little bit. I just haven't seen many performances in the last couple of years from him that I was really impressed by. But no, you can tell here he genuinely cares about this character. In a couple of key specific emotional moments, he's actually really great. Like, shockingly great. Also in that first hour, there are a lot of great action sequences. A lot of them are chases. You see the one in the trailer where they're going through the parade. That one was awesome, just really visually impressive. You can see James Mangold's sort of visual eye coming into play here. He might not be as good of a director as Spielberg, but that's like comparing something to the Holy Grail. It's impossible to meet that standard. Once the Dial of Destiny comes into play, the whole movie pretty much turns into a back and forth cat and mouse sort of game where Indiana Jones, Helena, and the neo-Nazis are all after the same thing. Everyone just sort of starts to fight over the possession of this device and for a while that becomes the driving force of the plot. And again, I don't mind that. I like that it's simplistic. Mads Mikkelsen plays the main villain here. The dude has never disappointed me in a role before and he doesn't disappoint here either. I do think there's a little bit of Doctor Strange syndrome here where he delivers a really strong performance but he probably deserved a more interesting character. Not that I hated the character, he's just He's kind of your standard Nazi who wants to, well, to put it mildly, do Nazi things. <laughs> Another positive that sort of goes without saying, but I want to mention it anyway, is John Williams. Nobody scores an action-adventure film quite like him, and he delivers fantastic work here, too. 
Another person who's just never let me down. Diving into some of my problems though, let's start off with Phoebe Waller-Bridge as Helena. This is a very good example of how to write an unlikable protagonist character. Or I guess in this case, sidekick to the protagonist. She's not the front and center of the movie. Obviously this is Indiana Jones's film, but there are moments in here where she's very much prevalent and almost his equal in terms of how much screen time they get. And from the moment they meet up, she mocks him for his age. She's condescending to him. She screws him over multiple times in the film and she's just so abrasive and argumentative and just doesn't really seem like she gives a shit about anything that happens for much of the film and that just becomes really frustrating especially when Indy's trying to help her and she continues to be abrasive and argumentative. Again, a movie like this needs strong supporting characters. I just don't feel that this was the route to go. Eventually we do see this bond form between the two characters but it's really late in the film and until then it's just a lot of them arguing whenever they're on screen together and it just it starts to become frustrating. The movie's also way too long. This thing's about two hours and 20 minutes. If I'm being honest, it kind of feels like three. Now, I like archaeological mumbo jumbo and stuff as much as the next guy, but it starts to feel like they're just introducing plot twists to add another location, another action sequence to bring all the characters somewhere else and add out some padding to the runtime without adding too much to the overall story. And it does this over and over again to the point that the second half, or I guess maybe the middle chunk of this movie, just feels like there's a lot that could have been trimmed out. I also found myself thinking about a lot of logistics issues pretty much constantly. Early on in the film, a character survives something that is 100% not survivable. And there are a lot of conveniences, people knowing how to do things that they just randomly know how to do and probably shouldn't. In a film that deals with geography and puzzles and things like that, I'm fine with a couple of conveniences, characters maybe knowing things that they otherwise probably shouldn't. But it does it so many times here that I was constantly taken out of the movie because I'm thinking about these conveniences and how ridiculous they are. Also, if you think Kingdom of the Crystal Skull goes off the rails in the third act, this movie says hold my beer because there are some wacky things that happen in the third act. And that's not really a flaw. I actually kind of enjoyed that it went that route. There are just a lot of smaller issues within that third act that kind of pull it back. And although there are some touching moments sprinkled throughout this movie, a couple that really got to me, it just doesn't feel very cohesive. It doesn't feel like there's a cohesive arc for Indiana Jones. And without that, it sort of feels a little bit empty and like they're trying to milk this franchise for money like Disney has done with so many others. I don't really feel that James Mangold's stamp on this film and Harrison Ford's performance and a couple of touching moments, a couple of really nicely written beats are quite enough to pull this up above that positive rating mark for me. Look, at times it definitely feels like a really serviceable Indiana Jones film, but it's so long and some of the characters are so annoying that I just don't see myself re-watching this much. Now, I might go on YouTube and search up the opening sequence and some of the other action shots just to enjoy those, but otherwise I'm pretty disappointed with this one. I'm going to give Dial of Destiny two and a half out of five, which happens to be probably my most popular ranking lately, I know. But I feel like it's important to remember that film criticism shouldn't exist in a binary. You can definitely have some middle ground. There are films that can have positives and negatives, and you don't just love it or hate it. Sometimes you fall a little bit in the middle, and that's how I feel about this one. Regardless, if you're a big Indiana Jones fan, you're probably going to go watch this anyway, so do let me know down in the comments what you think of Dial of Destiny. Is it better than Kingdom of the Crystal Skull? I think for me, it might just be a tad bit above that film, but again, I haven't rewatched it in a long time, so it might be a little bit premature to say that. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.